We've spoken before about the role of strategy and how important that can be to the success of any business, any organization, any real effort, to be honest. But my guest today is Faris Arangi, and he is an expert in not just the intellectual side of strategy, which is important, but also factoring in emotional intelligence and focus. The three things together will produce an effective strategy, and you can't really achieve it without having one or both or all three of those things. So we're going to hear a little bit more about why that is the case, how those three things interact, why it's important, and how Ferris works with companies to help them achieve this. He's also got some great advice for any leaders or managers out there who are struggling to implement a strategy and get the team bought into it. And of course, we will, as always, be talking about his experiences with leadership and his lessons learned from his career so far. This is Leading with Integrity, Leadership Talk, the podcast for first-time managers who are working in tech-driven businesses and teams and who want to be more effective, people-first leaders. Each week, you will learn the crucial strategies, mindsets, and practical tips that successful modern leaders follow to be engaging, ethical, and authentic managers who get the best from their teams. And we'll achieve all of this via weekly conversations with leaders, with leadership experts, entrepreneurs, and business owners, people who have already walked this path and have some amazing insights to share. With an added sprinkling of occasional solo episodes and some group chats where we'll have multiple guests. My name is David Hatch, and I will be your host. And leadership has always been a passion for me. After a career spent in a series of small businesses during 15 years in the aerospace industry, five or six of those at the end of that career were in a space startup in the UK. So trying to launch satellites into orbit, very cool stuff. And through all of that experience, I learned that the secret to successful management is in the ability to apply great leadership. And in turn, the secret to great leadership It's all about your integrity, putting people before profits. Welcome to the Leading with Integrity podcast. Leadership Talk for the Modern Manager, with your host, David Hatch. Hello, and welcome back again to the Leading with Integrity podcast. Faris, thank you so much for joining me today. Excited to talk to you and hear all about what you get up to. And on that note, I'm going to hand it over to you, the virtual microphone, um, yeah. to introduce yourself to the listeners, tell us a bit about your background, what you get up to, what gets you out of bed in the morning. Okay, it's a bit like being a stand-up comedian. You have to do your own intro. Uh, yeah. It's <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so, Faris Ranke, uh, I uh, I run a uh, small strategy consulting firm called Sheer Ghetto Consulting, uh, which is all about making teams and people more effective, uh, particularly around strategic decision making. So, we facilitate uh, strategy, uh, and uh, we also train in soft skills. Uh, because um, strategy is nothing if you can't get others to buy into it and execute on it. So having great leaders who can take others on the journey uh, is where we help. Uh, and so really, really great to be on your leadership podcast and discuss some of the things because uh, I've been doing this. You know, I've been running my company for about uh, three and a half years, but I've been in the strategy and leadership space for a good 20 plus years. Um, so seeing loads of good things and loads of not so good things. Yes, no doubt. Uh, yeah, love love the strategy concept as well. I think uh, exactly as you say, I think that for me is why communication has to be on any list of key leadership skills. I mean, in mine, it's one of my five C's of great leadership for exactly that reason. Because if you have the best strategy, the best product, the best idea in the world, but you can't communicate it effectively and clearly, what good does it do you? So I'm right behind you there. <laughs> well, then we might as well just wrap up this podcast now then. Uh, <laughs> well, we're in, uh, yeah, absolute agreement. And thanks for listening, everyone. No. Yeah.
I'm going to ask you some more difficult questions than that. Obviously. Okay, crank Otherwise, it up a bit. Yeah, here we go. So you talk about strategy, you talk about soft skills. I'm particularly interested in your work where strategy, emotion, intelligence, and focus uh, yeah. interact. So how do you see that interaction working? Yeah, so I see these as, as really uh, uh, super important, uh, critical components and pillars of being successful. Um, now, just just to give a bit more of my backstory and, and, and explain why I think these are important, I should tell the, the listeners or the watchers, um, I spent 15 years as a strategy consultant, so the kind who worked for the McKinsey's of this world and stuff. So I was paid lots of money to write strategies for companies, and my area of speciality was uh, energy and utilities, so big oil and gas companies, imagine that. And what I discovered after 15 years of doing it, actually I discovered pretty early on, is 90% of the strategies we wrote never went anywhere. Um, not because they were bad strategies, but because they were missing these components, because people didn't buy into them, people didn't understand them. Uh, they weren't in a position of safety to say, look, I don't get it, or I don't, yeah. So it, they'd just do nothing with it. It'd be an expensive door, uh, paperweight, basically. And it, or it could be because politics were happening in the boardroom and person A hated person B, so they were never going to agree on the same thing. Um, or because they were doing too many things. They're very, very common with companies. They're doing a hundred things. So when you add something else to the list, it never gets done. So um, that's why I stepped back and said, look, to be really successful, you need three components. Uh, IQ, which is the quality of the ideas. So do you have great ideas? OK, um, and if so, do you then have enough EQ, which is emotional quotient, to take people on the journey, ability to sell those ideas and get people bought into them? And then the third part is, do you have enough of this focus, focus quotient, FQ, to, to really focus on delivering on what, what you've said is important? So it's not enough to over index an IQ or one of those. You need all three components. That's why I put it together as an equation and said success is IQ times EQ times FQ. Uh, which sounds a bit rude, but is actually uh, uh, the components. No, I like it. It's a, it's a logical way of presenting it, and it, it highlights the fact that all of those things are multipliers of each other, aren't they? And as you say, essential to success, which, yeah, I, I, I like the approach. So the next question then naturally is, yeah. what does a successful strategy look like? Is it just that what? equation? What, what goes into making <laughs> that equation actually work? No, well, I mean, it is, it, it, it lies in that equation, obviously. So, you know, have, have a great idea, make sure it's stress tested, you know, so make sure it's got good amounts of IQ. Um, but, uh, and then the others are bought into it, right? Uh, Cause as I said, a great strategy cannot be just something that looks good on paper. If nobody is doing anything with it, if nobody's executing it, it's not a strategy. It's just a really good thought document. Um, and I've seen a lot of those over the years, uh, very good academic papers. And uh, so, yeah, it's got to come to life and it needs that that sort of others to buy into it. And it needs that focus to make sure it's actually completed. I've seen a lot of good strategies start, uh, but not finish. So actually, you know, they, you don't need the best idea. Sometimes it's not the best idea. Sometimes I go into companies and say, what strategy have you really got lying around? You know, often they've had an expensive consulting firm deliver a report. And I say, okay, which 10, 20% of this do you buy into? Let's do that. That's a much better strategy than having a 100% great answer that's sitting around doing nothing. So that could be a good strategy, right? Um, it doesn't have to be something radical changing the world. It has to be something that people are engaged and excited and out there to deliver. Yeah, and as, as you say, really, I mean, sometimes just having a bit of momentum is is a is success in itself, in itself, isn't it? Particularly if you've got that massive tome of strategy that's sat on a shelf for however many years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I laugh because I wrote those, and oh, uh, yeah. hey, well. you know, that's, <laughs> but hey, hey, that's that's what happens in life, right? Um, so yeah, we can all have great strategies, and they can be simple things. You know, and we all do strategies every day in our lives. You know, whether we actually complete them about you know learning a language, losing weight. You know, these are all the visions. So you have a strategy that sits under it. Um, it's exactly the same in big companies, uh, and many of them just don't ever go anywhere. Yeah, and from a smaller company perspective, so maybe a startup kind of environment, I found in some of the companies I've worked for or with, without giving any names. Well, quite often in those kind of situations, the bigger problem is less about having a strategy no one buys into and more about not having a strategy or not having one that's clear and understandable by everyone in the business or just not yeah. communicating it consistently. Oh, yeah, 100%. You know, and I work with 
big corporates and startups and as you say often with the startups they haven't structured anything and, and made it clear to everyone so on the same page and they assume they say look we're three friends who are all founders we all must know what the strategy is but even like a one percent difference you know they all leave the room and say something slightly different to the workforce so then that gets said slightly different and then, and, and then you end up going why are you working on this and you go oh well that's what i thought our strategy was right so you need that absolute clarity but also what i find with smaller companies is actually more around the focus because there's usually small teams they don't have enough arms and legs they really have to decide actually these are the five things we're going to do therefore these are the rest of the things we're not going to do and that's where they find hard because they want to chase everything um and so that that focus quotient really comes into play for smaller companies and the skill of prioritization i guess as well yeah. and and planning as well just what when and in what order that sort of stuff yeah completely completely <laughs> uh, it's always fascinating how people find it difficult to let go of ideas that they came up with mm, right yeah. it's that it's that disassociated even if it's not the best idea in a bunch they'll keep it somehow in the ecosystem and say oh yeah well you know so you need to find a way to help them reframe it and detach a little bit sometimes yeah and i think the opposite problem as well is getting people to buy into an idea that wasn't theirs um particularly when you get to senior management levels i think that gets really difficult <laughs> <laughs> it does it does yeah, yeah. um yeah. anyway let's not let's not bash the senior leaders anymore <laughs> um, so what what advice have you got then for for leaders for managers to ensure that they are integrating these three elements into their strategy what can they do to make sure those really bed in and um, i think uh you know uh, go through each of those pillars it, it's fundamentally what i i do or my team do when we go into companies go through each of those pillars and ask just some simple questions around them right um on the iq side uh is this i uh, have you got the best ideas or have you I, have, first of all have you reached out and got a wide enough cross-sectional ideas because often it you know people just exclude people around the table for one reason or another natural biases you know I, I can give you loads of examples of teams that i work in where for one reason or another they've excluded somebody uh without even realizing it you know because um so are you getting all the quality ideas have you picked the best one have you stress tested it you know lots of people pick an idea but how do you know it's going to work and there are lots of tools and techniques uh, and i can talk about these that you can use to stress test strategies before investing hundreds of millions of pounds um launching them so on the iq side those are the sort of questions to be asking on the eq side is do people buy into this right uh am i selling this enough and do i believe in it um you know what what are sort of the some of the responses I'm hearing because human beings invariably say no you know I've got a great slide that was given to me very early on in my career which says the 28 ways people say no without saying no right and it's just our natural reaction where we go oh well, yeah that won't work here or we tried that or so do a sense check of how many of these no's so are people actually buying into your stuff can you vary how you communicate it or get excited about it to try and and then the final thing is, is as you said how many other things are you doing? How much of your actual focus, you know, and I like to say, imagine you have 100 points of focus, how much are you giving to this? And if it's if it's too low, then you you know, you're doing too many other things, right? Because um, if it's important, it should be one of your top five priorities. Yeah, definitely. It makes sense. And I guess uh, my next question is, what, what role does the creativity, the, the perhaps the more artistic view of it, play yeah this. well it, it it plays throughout right you, you know you, you, if let's take the iq pillar your creativity should be unleashed there to generate as many ideas as possible before you select which ideas so many people just come up with one or two ideas ago that's the one and you're like it's much easier much better to have a hundred ideas and pick one out of them than to have two and pick one because the good thing is is if you come up with 100 or you know let's, it doesn't have to be 100 it could be 20. um and if your initial idea is rubbish or faces barriers you've still got another 19 or 99 to pick from whereas if you only have two and not only are you not sure they're the best ideas you don't have a large amount uh, and it's uh so so you unleash your creativity there and i do simple exercises with teams to to generate more ideas more you know whatever the topic once you've defined what the problem is but uh, and then you can apply that same sort of thing on the on the eq side if people aren't buying into it enough have a have a creative session around what ways could we get people to buy into this what ways could we change how we're communicating about this to overcome 
people's resistance you know and it might be how you present it or the language you use or where you present it you know there's lots and lots of ideas and then similarly if you find you're doing too many things do some creativity and say well how can we uh, kind of combine some things how can we rationalize this do what i call pre-mortems which is go through and imagine what happens if you remove each of those activities you're doing what's the worst case scenario um, and then you can kind of see actually it's not that bad if we remove that activity um, so uh, so there's lots of ways to kind of turn around your creativity to sort of bring each of those pillars to the fore yeah and i think one one particularly important aspect of all of this particularly well from my own experience anyway is the importance of getting that feedback so yeah. i think i mean you've mentioned it already but that whole loop of you know, achieving buy-in the change management piece the overcoming the natural human resistance to anything new or different and <laughs> it's all part of that whole feedback thing for me and how you get people on board you also might learn something from what they tell you about some of your ideas or the way you've tried to implement something and i think it's it's very important from a leadership perspective to make sure you you close that feedback loop as it were completely and um you know they often say i know we're going to talk about great leadership qualities they say humility is a, is a key one right mm. um, because it's very easy for different reasons to assume you have the answer and even if you do have the answer it doesn't hurt and i learned this personally the hard way setting up a business on my own life is much better your business is much better when you tell more people about it your ideas and bounce them off it you know i don't know about you but um i remember the first time i was a best man and i wrote a best man speech and i thought it was hilarious right and i remember my sister saying go on let me have a listen i went no 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 and she eventually wore me down and she listened to it and she went well that's not funny that's not good that doesn't make sense and you know while my pride was hurt she was absolutely right and i you know i realized a valuable lesson just sharing it and you just have to it doesn't have to be with everyone but sharing it makes it instantly stronger and better and that's where the humility comes in particularly as you get more senior you lose that challenge because because of your title and think people are afraid to approach you but actually stepping up out of your zone and going do you know what i'd value your opinion on this you know i don't know the answers i'm not the hero of every story um it, that feedback loop is invaluable yeah i think you're right particularly what you say there at the beginning about leaders thinking they have the answer i think there's also a very similar misconception where they think they're supposed to have the answer mm. and it's almost like that self-imposed stress and pressure isn't it of well you know i'm the leader i'm supposed to know the answer therefore i've, I've got to come up with something I, I can't be seen to go and ask someone else for what it is uh, and i think that one's e equally damaging actually so yeah uh, you're spot on Okay, so one more question about strategy. Can you give us an example of a strategy you've seen in perhaps a well-known company that you thought that was spot on, really like the way they've done that? Oh, I mean, sometimes it, sometimes it's the simplest strategies, you know, that are, are the best. Um, now, most people are, are sort of taken by marketing strategies, but actually some, some of the best strategies, um, uh, let's take the energy sector where I come from. Yeah, I often say a good strategy comes from defining the actual problem you need to solve. Then you could come up with what are all the options for doing. And that's what strategy is, is have a vision or have something, a problem you're trying to solve. Come up with all the options, pick the one. That's your strategy, right? How do I do it? So there's a there's an energy company out there um, who looked at the challenge of call centers. You know, have you ever run a call center for your gas or electricity bill, David? Uh, I can see the look of pain on your face, but yeah. Sadly, yes. I mean, an yeah. ongoing argument with one as we speak, in fact. Okay, <laughs> me too. High five. <laughs> right. So most most energy companies uh, take the approach to call centers as they are there to manage customer uh, inquiries. Okay, so how can we, so the question they ask is, how can we handle them in the most cost-effective way? So they tend to have one agent for 500 um, uh, customers who, Right, because that's a, that's what they discover is about the how much one agent can handle. Now, one energy company out there looked at this and said, "We're solving the wrong problem. That's just that's just catering to the complaints. How about if we could make the complaints or the interactions disappear?" So instead of hiring a call center agent to deal with five hundred agents and therefore pay them minimum wage of about twenty thousand pounds a year, they said, "What if we hired PhD coders?" mathematicians so that whenever someone rang they went into our code and changed it forever 
So that problem never happened again. So instead of paying 20 grand a year, they'll pay 150 grand a year for these people. And, and by doing that, they were able to have a ratio of initially one to 5,000. So, right. Uh, and so these people would sit on the phones, answer the phones. They'd say, oh, you've got a problem with the bill, right? I'll recode it. So that problem never happened for anyone else. And what they found is the call volumes came down and down and down. So I, that, they started with one to 5,000, then they had one to 10,000. So what I love there is they looked at what is the problem, picked a strategy that was A, counter to everybody else, but really solved the underlying problem. Okay. And they, they were bold because it could have backfired. It could have been very costly for them, but they backed it. They went with it. Lovely example of make sure you have the right vision, pick the right option, and double down on it. Yeah, and solve the right problem, as you say. Yeah, I, I love that. You'll have to tell me afterwards which energy that company is <laughs> I for, will. For, for unrelated reasons. Um. <laughs> yes, of course, yes. <laughs> what has been your best experience of being led? Uh, I've had loads of great experiences of being led, but I guess, um, do you know what, when you're more uh, starting out your career, you're more impacted and you're, you're more sort of uh, open to, to things. So I look back at some of the leadership I, I experienced when I was quite junior. Now, two things spring to mind. I actually started my career, David, as a school teacher. Uh, so some of the great leadership was from my head of departments and the, the headmasters in the school and, uh, and, and the tips I was given, you know, and some super valuable lessons. And, and, and often you learn most when you've just failed, you know. So I think back to my first year as a school teacher and I used to teach, um, A level maths and economics. Uh, so I used to teach 11 to 18 year olds. And I don't know if you ever thought of being a school teacher being a teacher. It's quite difficult. Uh, and particularly in your first year, the kids sense blood and they, they go for the kill, basically um they can smell fear yeah. they can smell fear and actually in my first year i tried to be every everybody's friend because you know i thought that's a cool teacher but you know what happened david i can take a pretty good guess yeah you could take yeah they walked all over me they walked all <laughs> over me and my head of department just she pulled me aside and said you made a stinker here haven't you you can never never you she said when you have two decisions to make yeah you know, always make the one that you can then ease up from so you should have started tough and then you can ease up from them because if you start soft, you you know, or easy, you can't become then a tough, uh, you know, cookie. Uh, and she said, this is the same in all decisions, right? It's the same as when you're communicating, always start short with small communication because then you can expand. But as if you go with the long communication. So she always taught me to think about when you have two choices, pick the one that still allows you some optionality afterwards. You know, so really good leadership. Uh, for me, those not just the, the the lesson I learned, but the way she told it. She waited, you know, she probably could have seen the car crash coming, but she let me fail. Uh, and that's actually been an ethos that I use when training other people or, or trying to lead them. Because you, there's only so much you can read in a book, but until you've actually got some some scars on your back, so to speak, you like, you're actually going to listen and change your style. And in a similar way, one of the best things when I moved into the business world, the great leadership for me was a leader who did live feedback. So three or four times a day would give me feedback, very small pieces of feedback based on the meeting we just had, the phone call we just had, little things like, you know, you used um too much, you, but also positive stuff. And so I got so used to getting regular pieces of feedback and giving regular pieces of feedback. That's such a game changer um, for most people who in their careers don't get a sufficient or good quality enough uh, feedback. Yeah, I like the the letting you fail thing because the temptation there is is to jump in and say no, 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 don't do that. This is why. But I think it's yeah. it's less effective, particularly with people earlier in their careers, because you know the impetuousness of youth and all that. We're less likely to take it on board, aren't we? I, I like the live feedback thing as well, but I feel like that's going to be really difficult to get right. And I can see you getting yourself into this position where you're like. I've got to give some feedback, but I don't know. I, I'll make something up or just imagine. Yeah. So before this, before this podcast, for example, and you mm -hmm. and I chatted just before, imagine you'd ask me, what would you like to get out of this podcast? Mm -hmm. Like one thing, then you give me feedback on that. So the other person is providing the sort of the, the, the guidance of, Hey, can you really focus on this? And this is where I'm happy for you to give me feedback. So a, it stops the, just give me any spurious thing, but also it says, Hey, don't, don't tell me about my dress sense or whatever you know tell me about you know my confidence or you know because that's the area yeah so it was a really 
yeah but it, like you said it takes some practice but it you because i got exposed to this very early it's something i've just carried on and actually i missed when i w moved on to my second leader who didn't do that and i was like hey can we do that and he was like what's that yeah it's not something i've experienced i must say it sounds interesting and and yeah i mean obviously did you some good as you say so yeah nice one okay so maybe that leads into the next question i don't know the next question is what's the best thing you've ever seen a leader do um yeah i mean those examples i've given uh, are, are natural things but i think in general it's um it is linked to that feedback it's it's giving up there it's creating the time to give to other people um and making it seem effortless right what, what i mean by that is often when i sit with that 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 manager of mine I never, it never dawned on me that they were a busy person that, you know, they never seemed stressed or rushed in those giving me that much feedback during a day because for them, that was a worthwhile investment and they kind of held at bay all the other things. So it made it seem like it was really quality time dedicated to me, which, which, you know, so I felt special. So I think that's the thing great leaders do. They kind of give over their time, but also don't do it in a way that it doesn't seem like, um, uh, it's a chore. Yes, absolutely. Like the, the, worst experiences that have stuck in my mind are the ones where you, you just ask for like a simple question and you get a oh or a look at the watch or a check something on their phone or anything to make you feel like what you've asked is their least important priority right now which is the absolute opposite of what a leader should be doing <laughs> exactly exactly um, yeah really yeah. Good. what's the biggest mistake then do you think that a leader or manager could make well, you can flip anything I've said uh, around. <laughs> yeah, but that's the easy answer. Come on. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> um, I think the biggest mistake is it it, it kind of sits above, you know, it's, it's it's not asking enough questions and not trusting your team. So um, you, you, you can't be a leader without followers. Uh, and if you don't put trust in, in followers, they will soon stop following you. Uh, they might turn up to work every day. So um, it goes hand in hand with that humility side, sort of um, releasing. Uh, you, you've got to at some point let go and say, actually, I trust these people because you can't achieve everything yourself. You know, we've all had those micromanager uh, leaders. Ma manager. So really good leaders is are not. Uh, and I'm not saying from day one, you know, sometimes trust has to be earned, but not giving enough trust and not letting go soon enough. Yes, I think you're right. Um, particularly interesting, actually, that you said you know they'll still turn up to work, and I think that speaks to a lot of the, a lot of the trends that we're seeing in the headlines of late about quiet quitting and great resignation, things like that, where them showing up and being at work doesn't necessarily mean they're following you as a leader. No. And so there's you know there's there's a level to which people will still do things in return for the paycheck versus what they might do if they believe in you, trust you, respect you as a leader. And yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's there's a world of difference if you get it right. <laughs> yeah, it makes your job a lot easier. But uh, well, that too. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but there's there's a lot of fear, and uh, it's the other side of the coin, and people can't imagine it, be, largely because they've not experienced it themselves. You know, a lot of new leaders um really struggle with that yeah i think so as well uh, and we people rail against these kind of these horrible leaders these bad bosses the people that they're just oh i hate them they're a terrible person but i think it's it's easy to forget that most of the time they're not doing it maliciously they're just doing it because they don't know any better they've not been taught another way of doing it and they're just emulating the way they've been managed yeah and yeah. so I think there's a, a bit of grace could go both ways in these situations. <laughs> it, it can do, yeah. Often, often the teams I I work with, it's actually, as you say, it's it's a, it's a two way street. There's ingrained behaviours both ways. Um, so it's not a, just a case of saying the leader needs to improve. His team or that her team needs to learn how to. If they are going to change, how do you need to change to make the most of that? Because often there's a parent child relationship where it should be an adult adult, which means both parties have to work on something. Yeah, absolutely. The parent-child dynamic is is so dysfunctional, isn't it, in the workplace? <laughs> it's very dysfunctional. It's very dysfunctional. But and you wonder, how you, you just yeah. wonder how people get themselves stuck in those situations sometimes. But then, <laughs> having been in that situation previously in another job, I, I realise it's not something that happens intentionally. You just 
you don't actually realize it's happened until it's too late and (laughs) And so sometimes the greatest thing is just holding a mirror up and that's often what i do just as part of my business particularly uh when working with certain leaders is show them show them the fact hold up the mirror um and then um and then hopefully they will come around and say actually yeah something needs to change here yeah which is another great lesson cultivate that self-awareness the self-reflection is, is using the word reflection a bit too on the nose when you said mirror that's fine i've done it now <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah as as my friend ben at university used to say to me he said the role i fulfill in your life Paris, is to bring you down a peg or two because everyone needs somebody like that in their life uh, it's a bit tongue-in-cheek but every leader needs someone who will just tell them how it is uh, and give them a real insight because and as you say as you get more senior you lose those people for different reasons well on the subject maybe of university friends yes if you uh, if you could go back in time in that wonderful yeah. future world where time travel has been invented yes what career advice would you give to your younger self yeah, well my delorean is already revved up but uh i think i think it'd be twofold one is around asking more questions and and not being afraid it's kind of along that humility of of, of saying i don't know that i think there was a lot of times in my career i pretended i knew the answer whereas i was secretly you know bricking it um and that's okay actually because by asking questions lots of great things can happen um and the other thing is is like many young people i was in such a rush i thought it i had to chase every promotion and i had to do everything and actually you know you reach a point and realize it's a marathon not a sprint and I, you know a lot of my colleagues who sprinted have burnt out long ago um and actually my life is no worse off for having you know missed a promotion by a year or something uh but when you're 20 in your 20s you don't realize that so somehow instill that it's okay kind of philosophy on my on my younger self yeah that's good advice Uh, i i love anything around leading with curiosity and questions instead of fear or the other things and it's funny i was just talking to someone else earlier about this the power of asking questions and we were talking about um a memory i have from my school days where a teacher very early on said always ask the question don't be afraid of looking stupid because nine times out of 10, maybe even 10, there'll be somebody else in the room with that same question who's too afraid to ask. So even if you look stupid, you've helped that person. Well, yeah. It's and that's always stuck with me. Yeah. And, and, and basically, you've just explained the uh, why Google is so powerful, right? Well, Anytime yeah. you type in a question, someone else has already typed it in. Uh, and that's that's what we all rely on, right? Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it sounds simple, but it's, uh, it's very hard that, you know, we, yeah. we learned to stop asking questions, uh, for different reasons very early. The question, question and the flip side of the other great thing you should do is listen more. Mm. You can't, you know, you know, if you ask a question, and you're not listening, then what's the point? But we uh, too many of us don't listen well enough. Yeah. Well, I think that's why leading with curiosity and questions is so useful because in a way it kind of forces your mindset to shift into listening, doesn't it? Because if you're speaking via questions instead of just for the sake of speaking, um, you're more likely to make your ears work, I find. Anyway, maybe that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> I completely agree. Then. <laughs> Good. Good. I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> Leadership Heroes. If you had to pick one person, and they could be yeah. alive or dead, past, present, real or fictitious, okay. who, in your opinion, would perfectly embody leadership, who would that person be and why? Okay. Uh, this was the question I was dreading most because I'm the kind of person who says there is nobody who uh, uh, embod- embodies uh, p- uh, you know, pure leadership, uh, which I take comfort from because actually – uh, you can't be the checklist of everything. I remember several years ago, um, I was asked by the company I was at to nominate somebody for International Women's Day as my hero, a female hero. And uh, then there was a brackets, please don't pick your mum. Everyone else has picked their mum. Uh, so I, I was like, I started looking at people and I was like, oh, I'm going to pick Mother Teresa. And then, you know, I, I just Googled quickly because I thought I knew about Mother Teresa. And then you realise there's a scandal behind Mother Teresa. Uh, and then you're like, Oh, I'm going to pick this person. Then you realize, you know, people were picking Hillary Clinton and there's a scandal behind Hillary Clinton. You know, so 
And then I was like, come on. And then I expanded my search. So there must be some, you know, people we've thought from leadership uh, across the years who is completely uh, blemish free. But, you know, everyone, even Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, somebody views them with a blemish, uh, unfortunately. So but that's the reality of life, right? You can still be a great leader but without ticking absolutely every box. Um, so it'd have to be some mythical made up person, uh, um, unfortunately, from the fictitious sense um, uh, that it embodies, you know, I'm thinking some of the fantasy novels I used to read as a kid or some of the 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 the, the, the modern sort of Harry Potters and stuff. And I'm still not giving you a specific name. You're probably like, come on, Farris, just give us a name. Um, so, yeah, um, there is no perfect leader. So just, uh, yeah, I could pick people who are pretty close. You know, I like the likes of Albert Einstein. Um, I don't think he was particularly a great leader because he was a bit too uh, focused on the IQ and not enough necessarily. But uh, I think I think those those are good kind of leaders. If only they they were better connected um, with with the rest of the world uh, would be a, a, a perfect combination. Yeah, I find it hard to argue with anything you said. Um, <laughs> and I do quite often offer the caveat that accepting that perfect is unattainable. Yeah. Um, it is an opinion question, really. But yeah, okay. 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 Well, um, then, 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 you know, like uh, Jerry from Tom and Jerry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, he always got his way. He uh, he influenced those around him. He created a lot of fun, you know, and he was only sort of about six inches tall. So, yeah, f fair enough, I guess. Um, <laughs> but yeah. You've never had that answer, David. No, I certainly haven't. But then we've not had Einstein either. That's quite an interesting thing oh, okay. as well. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, there, there's that. I, I don't know if it's true, but there's the story about where he does the maths in front of the school kids and he does it deliberately wrong. Yeah, he does. Yeah, the nine times table yeah. or something, and it's yeah, that's quite an interesting leadership lesson, isn't it? Parable, if you want. Um, exactly. Yeah. But then also his stance on nuclear weapons, I think, was for the time, given the context of what was going on, the courage it must have taken to speak out against something that most people saw as the way to win the war. I mean, that's that's something you have to admire, don't you? Especially in hindsight, knowing everything we know that's happened since, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I, I think, yeah, I think it's fair to call him a leader. To be honest, I think he's leading yeah. by example, if nothing else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, think how many people still reference him, still follow him. That's that. That for me is all the echoes of a and the hallmarks of a great leader. Yes, not without his con controversies either, though. Of course, as, it, as we yes. sadly know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, like I said, I, I agree with everything you said there about there being no perfect leader. I mean, the, the one for me that always sticks out in that kind of example is Winston Churchill, because everyone yeah. throws him up. But I mean, there were some big controversies in his life. <laughs> there are, there are. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess context um, is, the, is the most important thing, isn't it? That's, that's the it best. is. It is. And, and obviously, you know, you're probably doing this podcast we're both uk based so there's going to be a uk western uh bias but there are probably amazing leaders that we are oblivious to from the eastern world the developing world um so uh, you know go listen to more podcasts find out who those people are and read all about them you know yeah very true very true indeed well, Faris, it's been excellent talking to you today. Thank you for sharing your your wisdom, your insights, and some great stories as well. Um, last thing I'll do at the end of the episode is if the listeners would like to learn more about you, if perhaps they would like some help with their strategy at work, uh, is there a way that they can get in touch with you? Well, they're very fortunate there is. Uh, they can <laughs> they can look me up. Probably the best thing, two things are, one is look up my company, uh, website, uh, which is the company's called Shia Ghetto. Uh, that's S H I A G E T O. And it's the Japanese word for a sharpening stone because that's what we do for companies. We sharpen them. Um, so it's www.sheerghetto.com or look me up on LinkedIn. I spend a disproportionately large amount of time there, uh, uh, by choice uh, and look for Faris Aranki and uh, we'll carry on the conversation. Awesome. And I'll put links to both of those in the episode description so the listeners can find them easily. Well, that's it. That's That was it from me. So thanks again. Really great talking to you. Thank you.
Thank you again, Faris, for your time. That was a very interesting conversation. Particularly enjoyed talking about Einstein, as we've not had him come up before. Listeners, as promised, if you would like to learn more about Faris and what he does, um, learn about his company, Shiagato Consulting, you can find a website link in the episode description, as well as a link to Faris's LinkedIn profile. So do reach out to him. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. If you are a new manager, and I hope you are, because that is who this podcast is for, and you are looking for help with establishing yourself as a leader, with getting the most from your team, with overcoming that imposter syndrome that many new managers feel as they navigate that transition from practitioner to leader, then Leading with Integrity is here to help. Your first port of call should be www.leadernotaboss.com. There you will be able to join my online leadership community. It is exclusively available to my podcast listeners and to my past clients. It is there to build a community of like-minded individuals, people at the same stage of their careers, as well as to get access to all of my knowledge and experience on leadership in the hopes that it will help you make that transition easier. So if you are interested, Again, the link is in the episode description and on the website. Please do visit. Please sign up. Please reach out to me on LinkedIn if you have any questions. And I hope to hear from you soon. Join us again next week. We'll have another great guest and another brilliant conversation about leadership. And in the meantime, stay safe, take care of yourselves, think about your strategy. And as always, remember, be a leader, not a boss.